It was the heaviest, most debilitating fog London had ever seen. Outdoor sports events were cancelled. Public transport ground to a halt. The fog was so dense that it led to the cancellation of concerts and film screenings, as stages and screens became too difficult to see from the seats. This was no ordinary fog. It's 1952. Power plants and households are burning coal and pumping polluted air right into the heart of London. When a layer of warm air prevented the pollution from dissipating, it led to one of the most severe air pollution episodes in history. When you combust anything or burn anything, then you produce pollution. And that pollution falls into primarily two components. One is a particulate component, and the second is a gaseous component. These chemical entities are carried into your lung, which then react with the lung tissue or transfer across into your blood and get carried to other places in your body. Originally, many of the estimated 12,000 total deaths were blamed on influenza, but later it became clear that they were mainly due to complications arising from exposure to air pollutants. When we talk about susceptibility to air pollution, we classically think of either people who are very old or children. But we also know that there are individuals who are more susceptible to pollution than other people. They might have had asthma, they might have had emphysema, they may have already had a cardiovascular problem. This extra pollution that they were exposed to during that one week was sufficient to actually add to their burden such that they died. The deadly haze that plagued London in 1952 had been around in one form or another for thousands of years. Ever since civilization started forming, humans have depended on burning fuels for cooking, heating and industry. As long as man has been exposed to fire, there has been an impact on our bodies. Mummies that have come from ancient Egypt or from South America, when you image the lungs of these mummies, you find that they actually have the same type of lung damage that we see of people who are being exposed to high levels of pollution as part of their lifestyle. Air pollution was part of everyday life for the inhabitants of cities like classical Athens or ancient Rome, where the emissions from homes, smelting furnaces, potteries, and other pre-industrial workshops darkened the skies. Throughout history, emperors spoke of clean air as a human right, philosophers spoke of its restorative power, monarchs tried and failed to prohibit the burning of coal. But these fuels played a vital role in humanity's progress, so generation after generation we kept burning and filling our lungs with the resulting fumes. When that happens, that leads to a generation of signals which activates your immune system. These are the white blood cells in your body, and they come to a site of injury to try and kill whatever is causing injury. In normal circumstances, that would be bacteria or a virus, but in this case, this is a carbon particle with chemicals on its surface, and they really have difficulty in doing anything about these particles. This general inflammation then will keep occurring every time you have particles going into your lung. The onset of the Industrial Revolution brought about an exponential increase in the use of coal and other fossil fuels that drove industries, factories and machines. With air pollution emissions skyrocketing and rapid urbanization quickly concentrating large populations in industrial cities, the air pollution problem spun out of control. In these times, coal was really the only fuel source able to fuel these kinds of industries and uh, none of pollution control technologies that are in use today had been developed. So the impacts on air quality and health uh, were extreme, meaning diseases like black lung and uh, severe chronic diseases were very widespread. One by one, many of the leading cities of the Industrial Revolution suffered critical smog events. Shaken by them, the public started mounting pressure on governments to tackle the issue. In the following decade, a series of air pollution regulations were passed across the industrialized world. 
So the Clean Air Act was introduced in 1956 and banned the burning of coal, either in commercial energy power stations or in domestic homes. Now this was a very, very dramatic piece of legislation because new power stations had to be built outside city limits and the old power stations had to be shut down. The wave of new air pollution regulations led to dramatic improvements in air quality across the industrialized world. Yet, not all parts of the world have progressed equally. Some of the low to middle income countries across Africa and Asia are currently facing extreme pollution levels comparable to those experienced by the early industrial cities. Even in the Western world, improvements have not been universal. The countries in Europe with the highest levels of air pollution, Poland, Bulgaria, Romania, some of the other Central and Eastern European countries, they still have a long way to improve emission controls in power plants and industries, enforce emission controls on transport, and especially uh, reduce the use of coal and uh, biomass in heating. In the decades since the Great Smog, more and more research attention has been given to the health effects of air pollution. As hidden, long-term nefarious effects are uncovered, it has become clear that even in the cleaner cities across the world, air pollution continues to wreak havoc on our well-being. It's the long-term, low levels of exposure we have in our countries which cause, instead of a large inflammatory response. It's almost like a smoldering inflammation, very low grade, in your tissues, beneath your awareness, yes? But there, it's a bit like cigarette smoking. The person who smokes a cigarette doesn't drop dead because they've smoked a cigarette. They don't feel any symptoms. It's not because bad stuff isn't happening. It's simply that they are not aware of it. The effects of cigarette smoking are displaced in time to when you're 60, 70, 80, and air pollution is a bit like that. So actually, you know, air pollution might be causing a system-wide, a body-wide deterioration in our health, just wearing us down, you know, rusting us from the inside out. So one of the reasons that we increasingly focus on impacts of air pollution on children is because the trajectories of their organ development, of their cognitive development, it's still all ongoing. There's clear evidence that children in polluted areas have smaller lungs. There's evidence that their cognitive development, their learning um, is impaired. These are significant issues in, in young children. They have lifelong consequences. If that's not a motivation to act in this space, then I don't know what is. The latest research findings have compelled the World Health Organization to declare air pollution as the number one environmental risk to human health globally. It estimates air pollution causes 7 million premature deaths every year. The biggest source of air pollution globally is the burning of coal and oil, especially given what we know about the health impacts of even fairly low levels of air pollution is not going to be enough to keep putting on slightly better filters. We are going to have to switch to clean energy to have truly clean air. The scientific and technological developments of the 21st century have finally put a clean air future within our reach. More and more, fossil fuel-based energy production depends on artificial support, such as subsidies and legal protections, to maintain its place in our energy systems. It's a matter of public and political will to remove the barriers that are slowing down the transition and holding us back from reaping the benefits of clean air to our health and well-being. We as citizens have the power to bring about this future. We have the power of our voices that can push our political and business leaders to hasten the transition. And we have the power of our choices that put together are building a decentralized, democratized energy system where citizens are in control of their own energy production and communities are more prosperous and resilient. For millennia, humans have had little choice but to burn fuel in order to keep warm, cook and power industry. We can finally build a system that serves all our needs without generating emissions that harm our bodies and, through climate change, threaten our future. <laughs>